Um, I, everyone knows Marko Pajevic, uh, who teaches at this beautiful university. Um, he taught in Berlin, in Northern Ireland, in uh, London, and in Paris before coming here. And he will take us even further into this interesting topic that we're dealing with today. Uh, um, does my microphone work? Yes? Um, okay, that's there as well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, state control versus humanity, um, health biopolitics in Juli C's The Method. In German, uh, the title is Corpus Delicti, and uh, that is already from 2009. So we are currently experiencing an unprecedented um, acceleration in the biopolitization of society. The mediatic and political presentation of the COVID-19 virus has allowed for a far-reaching transformation of our forms of life uh, that few would have considered possible at the beginning of 2020. Fearing for the health, the vast majority of people have accepted curtailments of their rights and freedoms and granted the state a level of control over their lives that would have seemed ludicrous only weeks before. The obligatory wearing of masks, the introduction of uh, curfews, penalties for leaving uh, the area within a 2, 5 or 15 kilometer radius of one's home, a ban on meeting friends and family, these measures have become reality in most Western countries and have met with, with very little resistance. So I refer here mostly to the German situation where such measures have uh, been accompanied by public encouragement of denunciation and defamation of any kind, uh, of, of, of any kind and any open critic. So worse, journalists, policemen um, and medics who publicly oppose any such measures have lost their job or license to practice. Actors who produce satires on the restrictions have experienced a violent media crackdown and have been threatened by major television production companies with the loss of their current and future roles. Leading politicians have spoken of privileges when referring to what so far has been known as basic human rights. In July 2020, um, the much acclaimed German writer and public intellectual, Julie C published an explanatory book on her highly successful novel from 2009. So, the method, Corpus Delicti. This reactualization is no coincidence um, since the novel has often been touted as the book for the COVID era. The work is set in the mid 21st century and hinges on a court case against a woman who had begun to doubt the infallibility of the method, which is actually the health system the entire state uh, in the novel is based on. So this state has eradicated disease and pain to the almost anonymous acclaim, it seems, of the population. I will demonstrate here in the following why the biopolitics described in the novel is nonetheless now a utopia, uh, not a utopia, but a dystopia. Um, and yes, I think uh, we have spoken a lot about um, Foucault and Agamben, so I can simply cut um, that uh, bit. We know what we are talking um, about by now. Um, so, yeah, you know the, the, the key points of uh, Michel Foucault's uh, definition and what Agam Agamben made of that now recently as well. Um, what is interesting is that in the case of Julie C, we knew, or we know, we know that she was conversant with Foucault's and Agamben's ideas while writing the method, uh, quite explicitly so. So, a book by Agamben um, figures on the shelf of the protagonist, Mia. C's novel stands in the context of a general concern about the growing fixation on the body in our society. And she fears uh, for humanity and solidarity when a spurious notion of health is made the main criterion. So I have already mentioned how important uh, health is in biopolitics. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, a healthy person is functional, so that is useful already. Um, health industry is uh, one of the biggest um, 
economic powers and yes, it's a great tool of manipulation when people fear for their health. Um, so health biopolitics in this perspective um, is just another aspect of this restructuring of the state towards authoritarianism driven by instrumentalized fear. The method plays out what can happen if we give up our right to privacy and freedom for the sake of state control. She explicitly opted for political literature with this novel and intended to reach a large audience to influence public discourse and the way people think. Successfully so, by the way. Um, today, the novel is translated in 35 languages and in Germany often taught at schools. So it's really already, after relatively few years, canonical in many ways. So the method, as I already mentioned, is about Mia Holl, um, a young biologist um, in her early 30s, who lives a well-adjusted life in the mid-21st century, in a country we can assume to be Germany, uh, where health has become the foundation of the state. And with the help of state regulation, information technologies and surveillance, illness is practically eradicated. Mia, the biologist, yeah, is a supporter of the method, um, as seemingly everybody else, apart from Mia's brother, Moritz, who represents in the novel free will and the choice of an unregulated, joyful life. When her brother is accused of having raped and killed a woman and found guilty due to a DNA test of the sperm, he kills himself, but without ever stopping to claim his innocence. Mia had loved and trusted her brother, and this event throws her completely off track. So, disregarding the health, exercise and reporting requirements, um, she comes into conflict with the method. The conflict escalates quickly. Um, and she becomes opposed to the system in the course of events, which, in her view, had killed her brother and is represented in the novel uh, by leading... So the system is represented in the novel by leading ideologue and the journalist Heinrich Kramer. I will talk about him a bit more later. So C's book um, uh, documents in fictional form how health can become a privileged lever for judicial change. C herself holds the position of a judge at the institutional court um, of the federal state of Brandenburg, actually. Um, so she's not only one of the most successful German literary writers of our time, she is indeed a public intellectual and active um, as a judge. She's writing newspaper articles, she's appearing on talk shows, she's launching debates, um, publishing political essays and open letters to politicians. Um, in 2009, so in the same year as the method appeared, C published another essay, Attack on Freedom, Security Delusion, Surveillance State and the Dismantling of Civil Rights. Yeah, so a German title, of course, you have here on the slide. Um, she published that together with another um, militant, uh, famous German writer, Ilya Trojanov. And the context of their commitment to civil rights and C's fight against the dangers of a surveillance state cannot be stressed enough in dealing with a novel, The Method. They see, both of them, Trojanov and um, C, the main turning point in 9-11 and the instrumentalizing of a fabricated fear of terrorism by unjustified fear-mongering in the form of media hype. And the danger of terrorism, for them, consists mostly in our destroying our democratic freedom due to this fear. The introduction of torture and martial law in the USA for those deemed terrorists yeah, or enemies of the USA perpetuates a state of exception in the sense given, by, um, in the sense, uh, given to the term by Carl Schmitt, the leading legal, illegal thinker of the Third Reich. Um, whose ideas are still highly influential, particularly amongst neoliberal liberals. So C. and Trojanov also attack the principle of prevention, um, which contradicts principles of the rule of law, such as presumption of innocence, um, equal treatment, or interdiction of discrimination. 
Guantanamo um, has become, of course, a symbol for this new order. Troyanov and C remind us that democracy is fundamentally a limitation of state power um, and warn that democratic countries can destroy themselves um, from within when they forget this principle. Of particular interest is the implication of politics and media. The authors explain that fear sells, yeah? fear sells, and journalists as well as politicians feed off this hype. Um, the mainstreaming is explained by a lack of resources for genuinely investigative journalism. Inner security has become an attention cake, yeah, an Aufmerksamkeitskuchen, they say, and people fight for a slice of it. So in politics too, fear sells. It is a tried and tested tool of power, even when it works against our constitution and the political initiatives actually are regularly rebuffed by the constitutional court, in Germany at least. Since all these security debates bear no rational relation to the real situation of security in Germany, which has never been better, um, the authors conclude that the primary objective of the debate, um, about terrorism still here, is to direct attention from what is really going on, um, that is, the worldwide struggle for the new key resource, yeah, information, data. And that equates to power nowadays. So Trojanov and C state that this control hysteria, as they call it, has reached other areas, including the health system. So that's what they said already in 2009. Um, and of, obviously now we can see how it plays out in the health system. I have to talk a little bit about definitions of health here. So like terrorism, news about health appeals to fear and fear calls for protection by authority. So the novel merely radicalizes already existing phenomena, as we can see from the outset. Its first chapter offers a one-page extract from the preface of Heinrich Kramer, whom I just mentioned, his uh, ideological bible of the method. So the first sentence of this um, Bible of this uh, fundamental work um, for this entire state system um, is actually the WHO definition of health since 1946. Yeah, so you have the uh, definition here health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That is our official WHO uh, definition of health. And it is a first sentence in this book um, by Heinrich Kramer. Um, there is no explicit reference to the WHO. Um, the link is left for the readers to make. Caroline Welsh, in an article, demonstrates clearly the problems inherent in the WHO's definition of health by tracing shifts from the human right to health to a preventive duty of health. As early as 1806, such ideas arose, yeah, so with enlightenment, actually. Um, Friedrich August Röber, for instance, offering this succinct formulation. You have it here as well in German, so I read it in English. The citizen needs to be healthy and able to work to contribute his due to the conservation of the state. If he is not, he is a burden to the state and is worse than a dead member. So Welch comments that um, during the 20th century, free self-determination shifts out of sight in favor of a duty of health and demonstrates how the WHO has, in recent years, increasingly prioritized the principle of prevention. Welch argues that the WHO progressively focuses on what are considered to be risky lifestyles. So this renders the concept of health as a duty, normative, and morally stigmatizes non-conformist behavior. Voluntary self-tracking mechanisms for self-discipline are already in place and internalized by the people. So we are realizing already for years now Foucault's prediction in Discipline and Punish from 75. Hollywood blockbusters have already pointed to the risks of prevention in criminal prosecution, yeah? such as Steven Spielberg's Minority Report, that is already from 2002. Today, 
predictive policing is actually implemented in many places. And uh, it's a big thing. Everybody wants it. Yeah? Everybody. Well, the, the states want it. Want it. So um, C stresses that the method is based on the idea of prevention and that this idea by itself constitutes a threat to freedom. Welch opposes to this tendency the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, also now from 1948, in which health is defined as a component of an appropriate quality of life. And you have here again the uh, quotation. So everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond uh, his control. So in 2000, um, the UN confirmed this much more cautious definition of health as a right, I quote again, a right to the enjoyment of a variety of facilities, goods, services and conditions necessary for the realization of the highest attainable standard of health. So you see, here there is no, no claim to complete health anymore, right? Um, or even of a duty of health which would contravene, actually, the UN guidelines, which say explicitly that the state cannot ensure good health or protect from ill health. The Declaration of Human Rights embeds health very frankly, very clearly, within human rights, saying that the state has to ensure that health measures are compatible with other human rights and with human dignity. So within this context of human rights, we need, in fact, to preserve a right to illness, a right to illness, as Welch concludes, yeah? ein Recht auf Krankheit, as it appears then in the novel as well. And this Recht auf Krankheit, this right to, uh, to illness, it is threatened by recent developments promoted by the WHO again. So the novel opens thus with a conflict between the WHO and human rights, um, between health institutions and political emancipation. That's the absolute start of the novel. So, in this novel, the Recht auf Krankheit is also the name of an organization, a possibly fictional organization, um, that is left quite open, um, that fights the method. Yeah? So this terrorist, uh, I mean fictional within the novel, yeah? we don't know whether it really exists, but it is used by the authorities um, as, uh, yeah, as, uh, as a possibility of uh, creating fear amongst the population. So this terrorist group is referred to as RAK, yeah? Recht auf Krankheit, RAK. Um, that's a clear allusion to the West German leftist terror group RAF in the 1970s, obviously. The novel has Heinrich Kramer, so the chief ideologue, uh, ideologue uh, explain anti-methodism is a hostile attack to which we will react with war. And that's what they are doing then. Um, so Kramer's book, um, at, the, um, at the root of the method, is of course fictitious. Yeah? It doesn't exist. But its author has a real-life counterpart in history. The historical Heinrich Kramer was an inquisitor uh, and the author of the infamous uh, Hexenhammer, yeah? the witch hammer. Uh, uh, from 1486. That's actually the most influential writing of the Inquisition. Um, and correspondingly, um, there was a historical Mia Holl, or Maria Holl, um, who was accused of being a witch in 1593, and she survived 62 rounds of torture. Uh, and actually her resistance to the torture led to um, the Inquisition being kind of stopped in her town of Nördling at the time. Uh, so she's really a hero in that sense, and uh, yeah, no coincidence that the name corresponds. Um, so she was finally released and uh, did not die. Yeah? Uh, she was one of the very few witches who survived being accused. So Tse transposes the witch hunts into our times, or the near future in this case, 
pointing to the enduring presence of totalitarian tendencies, as for instance in the concept of enemy justice, yeah, Feindstrafrecht, um, so enemy justice, which fortunately has not seen a reintroduction in Germany in spite of some prominent uh, proponents. It is, however, to some degree already a reality again in the USA's war on terror. Yeah, so the keyword again being Guantanamo, which cancels the rule of law. So C insists on the rule of law for everybody. Despite its philanthropic appearance, Kramer's health system in the novel is totalitarian in character, and C brings that to the fore. So this is confirmed then in the second chapter of the method, the verdict against Mia Hall. So that is absolutely not, chron uh, not chronological. Um, uh, the verdict is at the very start, and then we see how, it get, how we get to this verdict. But it's interesting because it's right after the principle of the method. The method yeah? So uh, we can compare very clearly what that leads to. Um, so um, this verdict uh, in this position and content functions as an illustration of the health principles outlined in the prior first chapter. The verdict is declared in the name of the method. Yeah, so, a satirical shift from the democratic in the name of the people. Um, Holt's crime consists of methodenfeindliche Umtriebe. Yeah, so that's an expression in pseudo-political jargon for activities hostile to the method. Uh, infinitely flexible, obviously, in its vagueness and therefore at odds with the principles of the rule of law. The verdict does not refer to any real criminal act of Mia Hall, yeah? only its possible, possible present preparation or also of non-conformist actions. So it is a purely preemptive verdict and thus against our judicial uh, principles against, again. The penalty for Hall is to be frozen for an indeterminate time. And this non-determination of the penalty is also against our current principles. So finally, the accused must pay the cost of the trial, a further reminder of general totalitarian procedures. The method punishes unhealthy behavior such as smoking yeah, and obliges everybody to measure and to report regularly on their health, including allergic sensitivity, blood pressure, urine and blood tests, calorie consumption, sleep and exercise. Everybody has an implanted chip for monitoring and any shortcomings are penalized. Um, the system chooses sexual partners for individuals according to immunological compatibility. Having sex with an incompatible partner, incompatible partner is a capital crime in the system. All of this is evidently against our current European Convention for Human Rights, yeah, uh, which guarantees the rights to privacy, including data protection, um, the right of self-determination of the body as well as of lifestyle and choice of partner. Yeah? Those are all guaranteed rights we have. But C stresses that her presentation of things is not altogether a future fantasy. All phenomena mentioned are in fact technically possible and already in existence somewhere in one form or another. Her book is simply an exaggeration of already existing ways of thinking and acting. And she is convinced that many people today would agree to the method um, if it were a real option. Yeah? The population of the depicted state is, generally speaking, happy with the regime, yeah? including its surveillance and punishments. Yeah? The often heard argument in our times, of course, as well, I have nothing to hide, um, is a sentence C and Trojanov ardently condemn. So people with such an attitude um, have no problem with the existence of a secret service to control the population, the Methodenschutz yeah, in the method, method guard, or a health police force, the Sicherheitswacht, a security watch, um, the harmonizing of institutional powers um, is, is an equally logical consequence. Kramer who prepared and developed the method, interferes in media, legislative, judicial, and executive. That manifests itself also in social structures, um, such as the Wächterhäuser, the guardian houses, 
where the inhabitants survey each other on behalf of the state, with incentives such as reduced bills to encourage denunciation. They have disinfection machines, a bacteriometer, uh, and they are also marked by a badge, allowing them to forego indoor mask wearing. Yeah, 209, indoor mask wearing. So it was already a topic, the mask then. The parallels to today's Germany are, of course, undeniable. In a detailed analysis of the judicial aspects, Professor of Law Heinz Müller Dietz comes to the conclusion that the trial, as depicted in the method, corresponds only formally to the rule of law. In fact, the accused has no rights whatsoever, since the entire system aims at a total state control and leaves no space for basic or human rights. The lack of personal freedom is felt all the more acutely by those suspected of criminal acts. Parallels to National Socialism are made clear um, by, for example, the abbreviation Gestapo, yeah, Gestapo for Gesundheitsprozessordnung. Um, Mia, who is initially simply a mourning her brother, yeah, fails to adhere to these health requirements. There's lack of exercise and missed reports. Um, and this leads to a clarifying conversation first, ein Klärungsgespräch, then to a he hearing and a penal process with financial penalties, penalties. And then once her lawyer, Rosentreter, seeks an appeal of these penalties for actually his own personal reasons, because he loves an immunologically incompatible, incompatible woman and wants to take revenge on the system, um, the system now fights Mia as an enemy of the method. Um, Karma launches really a campaign against her and she's brutally arrested um, and imprisoned then. So when Rosentreter uncovers an error in the system, Mia's brother actually um, had cell transplantation as a child due to leukemia, a very rare case in that um, generation in the novel, um, and therefore he shares DNA with his donor who committed actually the rape of uh, the woman um, for which Moritz was condemned. Um, so an error in the justice system which yeah, raises questions and puts in question the entire system which pretends to be infallible. Um, so this moment uh, makes it possible for Mia um, as well to take up the fight against the method and for freedom, including the freedom to be ill. So she receives support from some portions of the society, actually. Uh, some parts of the population um, make demonstrations for her release from prison, uh, and also some journalists um, who begin to question this infallibility, or putative infallibility, of the method. Mia feels emboldened now, and publicly declares, from prison of course, but publicly declares her criticism of the method accusing the system of prioritizing security over life. Her declaration leads to mass demonstrations. She herself explains that she has become an integrative figure, uniting all people in doubt, offering a projection screen. And also for the RRK, yeah, who supposedly, as I said, we don't really know whether it's true or just invented by uh, Kramer, uh, who supposedly announce terrorist attacks, even though Mia wants nothing to do with that organization. So this, however, this connection offers Kramer the opportunity to retaliate, and he announces infectious thoughts will be annihilated. So he can now justify even stricter control um, also of the minds in the fight against the staged terrorist danger. So for terrorists, that is, enemies of the method, uh, laws of the state of exception are already in place. We know the verdict um, from the book's beginning, but Mia sees herself as victorious since her resistance made her a self-determined human being. Um, shortly before um, the execution, um, yeah, shortly before the execution, um, she receives grace, however. Um, as Kramer explains, um, the method is not foolish enough to make her a cult figure and a martyr. 
Uh, instead, she will be given psychological care in a resocialization institution. Yeah? So it will be Vertrauensbildende Maßnahmen, yeah? so trust building measures, uh, political education, guidance in the method. Um, that's what awaits her now. So the system thus will also try to break Mia's mind, um, to psychically uh, annihilate her in what she herself calls a re education camp, an Umerziehungslager. So the novel ends with this complete defeat. However, the reader is given no perspective on subsequent events. So we don't know, it's, it remains open. In overcoming her fear, Mia becomes self-determined. In the best sense of enlightenment, she escapes her known edge, but is for that very reason an intolerable danger to the system. Fear is the dictatorial instrument of power, and the people are kept in fear, here through the fixation on health. The promise of security, however, only increases insecurity uh, and fear as well. Fear renders pliable, um, as Trojanov and C, and C state. Yeah? So it shuts down self-determination and reason. That's a psychological fact, and there are lots of studies about that. So the biopolitical vision of humanity builds on this idea of controlling humans who are incapable of leading a self-determined good life. Biopolitics tends not to trust human self-determination. Karma is convinced that the method's idea of man is actually superior to all others since it is based on the body. And for him, the body is what makes all humans equal, not the mind. So Tse's intention, because it's a kind of a strange uh, opposition of body and mind that I, I would not share, but yeah, it's presented as such. Uh, so Tse's intention with the book was exactly this to criticize the contemporary economically and biologically determined idea of man. In Mia's brother Moritz's philosophy, humans need to have experiences. So Moritz is a little bit the, the figure of light here, yeah, who really gives a, the alternative option to what we experience in this um, totalitarian system there. Mia's experience of Moritz's illness as a child taught Mia to believe in the method since the health system saved her brother's life. Yeah? While it taught Moritz, on the other hand, um, to live his life, yeah? since he experienced the possibility of losing it. Um, consequently, he is not content with pure existence. He wants to live his own life actively in all its dimensions. Um, this is what he calls love. Yeah? Um, and he opposes this love um, to the thinking of security, which suppresses real life. So once Mia finally takes sides and fights the system, she finishes her declaration of resistance with the remark that it is only now that she understands what it means to live. Yeah, let's take a look at the parallels of this plot to the COVID-19 crisis. The dangers, I think, of exaggerated health biopolitics evoked in the method and the parallels to recent developments have become evident. Yeah, C comments on that today, of course, yeah, in 2020. I quote, uh, you have it there, what we should have avoided is the rhetorical exploitation of fear among the population for boosting the profile of individual politicians, imposing new security laws or generating media hype. C explicitly considers right-wing criticism of the German constitutional state wrong and dangerous. In her view, this state is one of the best worldwide, and wrong-headed mistrust of democracy, politicians, or the state leads to damaging right-wing populism. And I totally share that view. Democratic institutions need indeed to be strengthened, um, not weakened. However, the way in which COVID-19 has been dealt with in Germany and the stymieing of public and parliamentary debate on appropriate management of the situation has led to division and increasing numbers of people losing trust in politics, science and the media. Democracy cannot be maintained by undemocratic means. Only open debate can foster and sustain democratic trust in democracy. So this is also the principle in academia, as we all know. Yeah? Scientific truth is not what one school of thought um, says, 
but it's the result of constant debate. So this debate is very much missing and lacking, I think, uh, in what's going on at the moment. So the real events have confirmed that nowadays health and security are prioritized over freedom and human rights by the majority of the people, um, at least for a certain time, and when they are strongly manipulated by political discourse in collaboration with the press. Most journalists have actually agreed, uh, and that's also facts that can be easily proven in Germany, um, probably in good faith, I mean, to support the government. They wanted to do that explicitly, which the government which pursued a planned shock strategy so that the population would follow the regulations. So the German government also procured a scientific study with a desired shock effect. Gewünschte Schockwirkung. That's really, that's a leaked document from the government. So that hard measures would be accepted. The scientists complied and in preparation for the first lockdown in spring 2020 presented a worst case scenario with a million people being turned away from hospitals and dying at home painfully uh, by suffocation. Yeah? A horror scenario often repeated by the media. Some virolo virologists actually had predicted such horrors years earlier, uh, for instance in connection with swine flu, without any confirmation in reality. And the main virologist who shaped the policy in Germany um, was already one of these people who said that already years ago at another thing where in reality 154 people died, um, that is Christian Drosten. Um, so, but this time, um, people were much more biddable due to the combined efforts of politicians, scientists and journalists. And everybody believed this person who was proven to be wrong um, several times before. Um, so in the long run, um, such manipulations and procedures weaken politics, established media and science. By constantly repeating hypothetical threats and using statistics shorn of the wider context, politics, media and some scientists have created fear without giving su sufficient space for other qualified opinions. Many lockdown measures have been considered anti-constitutional by German courts and have had to be withdrawn. The German constitution requires the principle of Verhältnismäßigkeit, yeah, commensurability. Um, that is, a measure should not cause more problems than it prevents. Warnings that the consequences of a lockdown uh, will cause incommensurable, incommensurable suffering, that is, much more than the virus itself causes, and corresponding studies have not been sufficiently taken into account in public debate. So it took a year for them to gain some momentum, swimming against a forceful tide of fabricated media consensus. Our situation today is obviously not the method, yeah? um, but there are many signs that public discourse is heading in that direction and needs to be rerouted to prevent further undesirable developments. And in my view, Ulysses literary fiction is a legitimate and convincing warning uh, and a crucial tool for raising awareness and preventing corrosion of the constitutional state. And with that, I end and uh, hope that you have questions and we can continue the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you very much. And I'm sure there will be questions. And who would like to start us off? I saw this was the first yeah. hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, thank you for that uh, great talk. I listened carefully, but I first I have just a, a, a short question. In, in Ulysses' novel, yeah, uh, or let's say, how would you characterize this novel? Is there a, uh, just a, a, a big gap between the methods and the people who suffer from them or who fight from them and try to emancipate themselves at the end from those methods? Is there just this big gap? Or is there also a moral conflict between the methods and those are, who are behind or agitate behind the methods and the other side. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Frank. Um, it's good that I have the occasion to specify that a little bit. Of course, we don't really go that much into several characters. So we deal mostly with Mia, and there are some philosophical um, discussions between Mia and her brother. Yeah? So there are flashbacks into the past uh, um, by which we can see how Mia develops from a supporter of the method to uh, an opponent. Um, so we have this kind of development, and, and there are, of course, the two sides. Yeah? So Mia believes at the start that this is great, and we can see how, in many ways, it is great, because there is no illness anymore. Yeah? So it really does a lot of good. Um, but then, finally, um, the very clear message in the end, and in this development, is that the price is too high, that it really comes um, not only at, uh, at the price of a suppression of freedom and of all different forms of life which are not possible. Yeah, the real contact with other people and uh, nature and so on, all of that is, is dangerous and, and suppressed. Um, but it also comes um, um, at, uh, at the price of a feeling of security because this focus on security actually leads to a feeling of insecurity. Yeah? So there really, if uh, there's one example, uh, a mother says, um, I heard my daughter coughing in the next room, and I almost died of fear. But actually, they were just playing uh, healthcare. So you know, the child was coughing to pretend in order to um, see how it used to be. Yeah? Um, um, but yeah, the mother was almost dying of fear. So it's constantly present. People are constantly in this feeling um, that um, there is a terrible danger. Did I answer your question, Frank? Uh, may I have follow up? Once just yeah. a follow up. Yes. Uh, brief, uh, the background of my question was simply that uh, I realized that the uh, uh, says novel, which I have not read, unfortunately, uh, is from 2009 or so, yes. 2008. Uh, so, um, and, and now, I mean, in, you also mm, refer to the situation in Germany and the German public. So. Uh, in the German public, I think now, right now, and throughout the whole crisis, uh, morality is very important. Morality is actually what divides society. Uh, If we okay. talk about a totalitarian hmm. background, there can't be any morality anymore. Hmm. Yeah? And that was the, the, the intention of my question to see. Yeah, sorry, I yeah. didn't understand that probably uh, at the start. Um, It's not that much a question of morality. That is not really central in the, in the novel. Um, but it is a question of, of, of a good life and what that implies. So what kind of human beings do we want to be? And that, of course, is in some ways also a moral issue. Yeah? So do we want to lead a life where we just uh, isolate ourselves in certain ways in order to not endanger bare life, maybe, yeah, or um, however we want to call that now, um, or do we want to also take uh, risks, maybe, is it not more moral somehow to live love, how Moritz calls it, yeah? um, and to really uh, engage with the other uh, in various ways, which are made impossible by this logic of um, the method. So that would be, I think, a moral dimension. Yeah. Another question here. Thank you very much for your talk. I think it was very interesting, and I, I could have asked a lot of questions, actually, but I, I think I will focus on uh, what I think is the most important aspect, because, uh, which is, uh, in my opinion, the, yeah, the shift from human health to the preventive duty of health. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand. The, uh, the, shift the, the shift from human health to the preventive duty of health, which you uh, talked about yeah. before. Uh, and I think you're very much aware uh, of the discussion about 2G in Germany, where to public events, there's a discussion whether you could only admit the vaccinated people or uh, people who have had COVID and then recovered from it. And uh, I just today read a newspaper article where there was an event uh, which turned to a super spread event, which was a 2G1, uh, uh, but there were no serious consequences um, for the people because they were all vaccinated. And so um, some people now say that is an argument for 2G because there were no serious consequences, but I guess this goes in the same uh, direction as you said, because after all, you're, if, by not admitting the tested ones, um, you basically only protect them, 
And I guess this goes uh, with this right to, to illness, which you talked about earlier. But I think there are also other areas, like, for example, the legalization of cannabis, interestingly, also blocked by the same party who has the uh, health minister or uh, decided by the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the constitution called the right to die, um, which is about um, whether you can... Yeah, help with people who want to die, or whether you can have the professional help, and it all comes from the same party, the same minister, actually. Um, and so, yeah, um, I don't know. Maybe you have some thoughts about that as well, because I, I guess you are all like with the logic. I would assume that you are all very critical about all of these points, right? Yes. Um, so the the two or three G discussion in Germany that's a bit uh, difficult to understand if you don't have the German. So G stands for geimpft, genesen, uh, ge, um, geimpft, genesen, getested. Yeah. So tested, vaccinated, or uh, healed. Yeah. So you need to have um, now two of the Gs uh, in many places in order to get in. So. Um, uh, that is, of course, an exclusion of everybody who does not um, submit to these measures of public life. Yeah? They are really effectively not uh, wanted in society somehow. And I'm very critical of that um, because um, the statistical data does not really support it. It's completely contradictory. Yeah? So uh, we know that also with the vaccination, um, you pass on the virus, you can have the virus and pass it on. Um, and if Nowadays, when everybody have this, has this possibility to be vaccinated but does not want to, um, then they take a risk on their own. They don't endanger anybody else more than anybody else. You know? So um, there is no logical, rational, real argumentation for that, if you ask me. So I cannot really subscribe to that. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm very critical of, of all of these measures. I find them highly problematic because... Um, in order to create some kind of activity or the, giving the population the feeling that we do something about something, um, uh, yeah, we take risk and we endanger our democratic principles. Daniela had a question. And sure, sure, sure. No, no, we'll take as much time as we need. I think this is a really important question. So if I may exercise. Yeah. Okay. Yes, but if if it everything is like that, yeah, I I, I will try to I try my best. Um, but uh, people tend to assess risks not as they are in reality, uh, which I guess we can see with the popularity of I don't know gambling, for example. So this is also an aspect people tend to turn to, maybe even wrong sources, some sources that are not true, like that are, yeah, telling wrong data and stuff. So this is also a challenge which you. By only giving people freedom, I guess you won't solve. Yes, um, that can go into both directions, of course. Yeah, the uh, uh, misconception of, of the risks, um, and that's why I always say, well, we need a real debate, a public debate on what's really going on, and then we can do that. Otherwise, we are always in, in, in the thinking of the myth, right? Um, so we need a debate on what's really going on, but it is. It is presented as if that was a clear thing, but it's not. Um, and that, that's a problem with all of that, because obviously, you know, if there's a real risk, then I, I'm all for protecting oneself, but I'm also all for people being able to um, take that judgment, make that judgment themselves, um, as long as they don't endanger other people, which really seems to be the case. Um, so, um, yeah, important, very important point. And, uh, um, we can misjudge the risks and then uh, we need to protect the others, but we can also overjudge the risks and uh, then suppress the entire principle our society so far have been, have been based on. And that's a very big risk. Daniela, uh, Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, and uh, I will definitely read the, the novel and, and the interventions by uh, you lead, say. Um, so maybe it's a follow-up a bit. Uh, um, I agree on um, on uh, these risks of uh, transforming health into a duty, not not a right, and uh, and that we should always check the way in which state reacts to these emergency situations and the possible authoritarian so turned. What I find a bit um, problematic and sometimes disturbing is a bit some. Uh, 
dismissing some premise to this uh, kind of argument. So the idea that, uh, well, terrorism uh, is not a real threat or the pandemic is not a real threat, but uh, it is invented or exaggerated. And, and in the same way that fear uh, is a result of brainwashing. So of, and the idea of a majority, the majority is always so this one who is scared and who provoked this kind of reaction. So I think that uh, uh, maybe we could start from the premise of that, uh, uh, that threat is real so, and that fear is legitimate. Um, but uh, the important thing, what we do with this uh, fear. So, uh, because with this missing so, uh, attitude, it is, it is the same with populism. It's this missing attitude, far-right far populism. This missing attitude that simply brainwash people uh, is not very productive for me. So, and the result is the contrary, that these people will uh, uh, be even more scared and they will say that, well, uh, you, you don't know, so simply. Uh, and uh, for me, this uh, relates with uh, self-determination in the case of COVID, so that you uh, stressed, and I think it's a very important uh, thing here. And once again, this, this uh, very old and maybe kind of a bit too traditional <laughs> idea of a relation between freedom and responsibility and uh, should not uh, self-determination include uh, also taking responsibility for the situation, both on the individual and collective level. So, for instance, uh, I would argue that um, uh, well, we can we can be against all these measures, but then we should definitely vaccinate and uh, and take the risks that uh, vaccinating uh, um, uh, implies. So that, uh, that, uh, in order to uh, avoid the other measures, uh, uh, so that there is a, maybe a compromise here. But for me, it is exact, exactly a matter of self-determination. So it's not a matter of something which is imposed on us. But we have to make choice in a difficult situation. And, uh, and the choices are limited, actually, uh, not so many. So you have a microphone. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Daniela. Um, yeah, those are um, good points that you made, and it's it's good to enter into this debate. We would need a lot of time if I wanted to react uh, with uh, you know giving a certain basis for that, because I'm af I'm afraid that the entire debate is is really. Um, but take a little bit of time because yeah. I think it's important. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think that so getting into numbers and now and so might be might be a little bit problematic uh, because I you would have to give quite a few numbers and studies and so on, and then compare that with the perception um, of the threat, um, which is certainly not the same thing. And that, that was also one of the main points I wanted to make, that there is a real uh, orchestrated and wanted uh, creation of a situation, of, of, a, of a perceived, of a perception of a situation, um, which does not correspond completely to what's going on. Um, but most people believe that. And I mean, people, you know, driving in the car with masks on their own shows that really they have no idea what's going on and they just follow some, certain things. But it's all a question of this term of commensurability, yeah? Verhältnismäßigkeit. I think that is really key. Um, and uh, it's not for nothing that this is part of the official um, uh, legislation, yeah? We need such terms and, of course, that is a term that constantly needs to be debated. Yeah? There must be a discussion about that. And in order to have a discussion, we need to have people who do not agree with some kind of mainstream position or, I don't know, the, the, the ordered position of the government yeah, who said, well, this person, this specialist, that is this specialist now. No matter that he has been terribly wrong in former years, we don't mind. We announce him to be the specialist, the greatest person, the only one who knows everything. And um, they never, ever, to this day, and I find that absolutely scandalizing, there has been a debate of that specialist with other really great specialists who counted as great specialists up to this crisis. But all of a sudden, because they disagree with this one specialist, um, they are dismissed and treated as complete idiots, yeah? covid Jordan, covid idiots, and so on. So there is no debate of different camps. I mean, if they, if they are idiotic, if the other numbers are not founded, 
then, or, oh no, it's not only the other numbers, it's the interpretation of the numbers, because the numbers are always the same. Yeah? So we are, nobody argues about numbers. We all agree that we use the official data, um, but um, yeah, they can be interpreted very, very differently. Um, and that is taking place. So we should have a public debate on that. And if that public debate shows that actually the government line is completely right, I am the first one to be happy with that and say, yes, okay, in that case, um, I submit to everything. But um, I have more than doubts about that. <laughs> I would like to also ask, I don't want to take anybody's, can I ask a question first and then? Thank you. So I, I have a threefold question. And, you know, well, the, the, let's, let's start by saying that um, we have to separate Ulitsi, uh, the novelist, from Ulitsi, the public intellectual. You can be a fantastic novelist and a really bad politician, and, you know, morally speaking, you know, we, we were talking about Pablo Neruda last night, you might agree or disagree with his politics, but you might still love his poetry. So, and she is a great novelist, so nobody disputes that. And that novel is obviously, you know, one of the key dystopian novels written um, in German in, in the last decade. Um, so, my three questions are really, and then we, ha we have to separate your own approach to Ulitsi and your interpretation of what you presume she believes, um, and what then you, or we all of us, you know, any interpreter, any reader makes of what we think uh, the author may or may not uh, represent for us. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be Ulitsi, it could be George Orwell, for instance, right? Um, so, three questions. One, a question about science. And I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, articulate them uh, concurrently and then I'll let you decide um, on how you wish to respond to them on science. Well, first of all, I believe there is a debate and I don't disagree with you that the debate might be skewed, but if I understand you correctly, what you want is what's happening in the U.S., where every side is valid, and this leads to disaster. Because in science, unlike in hermeneutics, there are not always two truths and two sides to every issue. Sometimes the earth is simply not flat. And the space is curved, and there's no need to debate that. Until a paradigm shifts, as we all know from Thomas Kuhn, and then we can start another debate. So that's the difference between science and the humanities. So we can debate Ulitsi. So that's the first. The second is on the individual who is only responsible for his or her own illness. I recently spoke to another very famous German author about this issue, and he suggested, well, those who only think that they're responsible for themselves, if and when they find themselves at the hospital because they exercised their right, they should pay for it. I don't want to pay for them if they decide not to vac get vaccinated. So that's an important issue. And again, it's not my, I, I don't have an opinion on that. I don't live in Germany, so I don't have that problem, literally. And the third one is uh, concerning Yulitsi, and if she were here, I would ask her, um, ask her uh, herself. Um, and I agree with her. Uh, I have nothing to hide this kind of rationalization of uh, permissibility in terms of data collecting is a very simplistic and lazy way of dealing with surveillance, right? So my, it's a very simple question. How come, and you know, I'm not trying to catch Yulitsi out and prove her wrong, not at all. But it's just a fact of life. Yuli Tse has a Facebook page. She has a Twitter <laughs> account, and she has an Instagram feed, and she, as far as I know, is on TikTok. So, what? So how does this go together with everything we now know about her? Thank you. Um, yeah, I try to um, answer all these points, and there, there's, I could talk for hours, of course. Um, so, first of all, science. Um, here we don't have a discussion of that sort. Nobody of the opposing camp, which doesn't get, to, in my view, a public forum. I'm happy to hear that that is different in, in the States. But nobody there denies uh, the scientific aspects if, you, if we come to numbers. 
they just interpret the numbers differently. And we are all wrong if we think that natural sciences are a matter of hard facts. Uh, yeah? um, they need language and they need interpretation. And we can interpret these numbers in a very different, we can present these numbers in a very different way. Yeah? We know very much about how statistics and so on can be used for all kinds of things, whatever you want to prove with them. Yeah? And they are used in a certain way and you can use them in a different way. But there's not different sets of statistics that are used. So the numbers are the same. The interpretation of them are different. So it's not a question of Earth being round or flat. Yeah? It's the same thing, but what does it mean? Yeah? So if someone, somebody says, well, it's flat because we all have experienced that God hates us and he has stepped on it, um, yes, uh, that's a different thing. But that's not the discussion here. Uh, it's, a very, it's on a very different level, the discussion, which, in my view, does not really take place. Um, so, first point, science. Second point was, um, if, if you are responsible uh, for yourself, should you not pay yourself? I mean, this is a, a, a problematic uh, question, and we have that, and we are very, I mean, now, in a few days or weeks, it will be implemented, that you will have to pay for that. I mean, there have been lots of debates. Some countries went back on it, others uh, uh, did that. Of course, we always have to consider that every country has very different situations and policies on that, but... Um, that's also quite interesting, yeah? so it will be very interesting to see what will happen in Denmark, yeah? where there are absolutely no restrictions anymore, uh, whereas the health situation is actually quite comparable to what's going on in Germany. Germany, extreme strict control, Denmark, no control whatsoever anymore. Um, so what will happen? Will they all die in a few weeks or not? Yeah? Um, let us guess. Um, but um, let's... Uh, so if in Germany and in many other countries we have to have these Gs, yeah? so we have to be either vaccinated, if you have your reasons not to want to be vaccinated, it's a problem, you have to be um, healed, well, you were unlucky not to have it already, so um, you cannot use that neither, and uh, you have to pay for your tests yourself, which would add up if every other or every third day you have to get a test, that becomes expensive. Yeah? So this is a clear measure of forcing, of coercing people into getting vaccinated. No doubt about it. It's, a, it's an indirect coercion for vaccination. Um, so if you have to pay for that, and if you have to pay even for your health care, fortunately that is so far very little seriously taken into consideration. Some people always suggest it, and there's a risk that sooner or later that will come because um, the discourse is shaped into that direction. Um, I find that extremely problematic. Where do you stop and where do you end? So now somebody who drives a car will have to take a certain percentage of the risks or somebody who smokes and so on and so on. Yeah? Where do you stop, where do you, where do you end? If we want to have some kind of, yeah, who decides on that? Yeah? It's a government who decides on who has to pay for what to which degree. Do we want to go there down that road? I don't think so. Um, that's very, very problematic in so many ways and not really realizable in any decent way. So that was the second question. Third question was? Just in general. Ah, yeah, Julie Tse. Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, I think that Julie Tse is very happy to have the possibilities of uh, uh, presenting her thoughts in very different ways. Yeah? She wants to reach an audience um, uh, and uh, she will use also various media to do so. Um, that does not mean that we don't have to be critical of that. So she will criticize, and they, she has written fantastic um, newspaper articles, essays of all sorts on these kind of issues about our media society and what it does to us. Um, it's very interesting. Um, of course, she well, needs uh, media any, anyway. It's not about um, having, um, having a yes or no. Yeah. We, we don't want to go back to the Stone Age. Well, we don't want to go back to, I don't know, before Gutenberg. Yeah? We are very happy to have means of communication. But we have to be aware of the risks involved and we have to find ways of regulating those risks. Um, so, yes, it's easy to, to criticize anyone who criticizes by saying, well, then don't, don't come here, don't talk about it. Uh, or don't use the possibilities of, of reaching an audience. Yeah? So, you know, I, I thank you so much for these very, very, um, I'll, I'll pass it on in just a second. I just have one quick follow-up um, out of pure, you know, theoretical and analytical interest. And um, the last one, <clears throat> I, 
I think, you know, your response to the second one, I, I, I fully agree with you. Where do we stop? And this is exactly what I told this author whom I spoke to. Um, it's still, apparently, it is on people's minds. Mm. But to, to, to the last point, um, and this, for, you know, I don't, I, I don't, you know, it's easy then uh, to dismiss the questioner who questions the author in turn as a kind of facetious um, a person, uh, you know, uh, digging into something that is self-evidently, uh, basically, performatively impossible to, to uh, uh, wrap your mind around. But there are differences in how we use media. And someone who is avidly averse to big data could do without Facebook of all platforms. So it's like saying, I, f I will fight the Third Reich, but I will engage Goebbels as my media representative. Um, you know, this is too simplistic. So I think uh, it's not dismissible. And I think this is real bad faith on her part to, and you know, it doesn't stop there. Her publisher, Penguin Random House, needs Amazon to sell. Without Amazon, any publisher will die. Yeah, but the structure so, is so, there. So if you, if I know, you but you don't have to use, use the structure. The structure. Then you, cannot, you cannot do anything anymore. So well, that, she uses the platforms in order to say, yeah. we have to but that's, control but these But that's platforms. not an explanation. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a justification. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cognitive, a it's but, cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's a dilemma. Yeah. Well, it's a dilemma, but you can avoid this dilemma. You can, for instance, not write. Mm -hmm. well, it's I, like saying you have to publish in the Third Reich. People stop publishing. Some people left and did it differently. So, I, you know, I, I think as an author, she's, you know, stands on her own, and it's, you know, she's a great author. Um, I actually think she's a better public intellectual than an author. Uh, well, I think <laughs> I mean, this, this, this dystopia crazy. is a really important book, but as a public intellectual, yeah, there's such, you know, fissures in her approach. I mean, again, any author who uses Facebook and Twitter and then berates big data, I mean, literally, it's, it's just, it's a contradiction that is not simply laughable, it's, it's a political problem. And I, you know, it just, it's, I can't understand that she has not been critiqued for this. So that, that has nothing to do with you, it's, and no, no, I wish she were uh, here to answer. You have a very important point there, no doubt. Anyway. So how do we deal with the media situation? And sorry for <laughs> and then probably also have to stop. Um, it's, it's just a short one. Um, I, I regularly still think about the, the, the book um, and I wonder how close are we actually to um, the world presented in the book because um, uh, it's a bit a connection to the second question, um, pay for your health and uh, if you think about it with our um, public health sector and in insurances, you can hand in your 10,000 steps a day and get bonus points and basically get money or stuff for your health. And uh, so I still think about this book because of that. How close do you think are we actually to the method? <laughs> yes, thank you, Oka. Um, yeah, um, I mean, as we said, everything which is described in the novel to some degree is feasible and exists already to some degree. Um, I don't think we are quite there, yeah? we are not in the method, but it's, it's really, I mean, I ended on that. It, it, we are heading into that direction, and it's not only now with COVID-19, yeah? that's only one, uh, one very big step into that direction, but that has started, of course, a very long time ago, so the entire digitalization, the entire war on terror and everything, all of that leads into one direction where we have this tendency that our societies go more and more into this idea of being taken care of. Yeah? Uh, in, in, in all possible meanings. Um, and yeah, as we also said, there are some good points to it, <laughs> but uh, we have to see that we keep in control of it and are not overwhelmed, because at some point it might turn to the situation where we cannot do anything anymore. Yeah. So I can now still say this here. Who knows uh, whether that will still be possible in a year? Who knows what that will do to somebody to take such a position. And we, well, Agamben, he is now with his uh, positions, he is almost persona non grata. Yeah? Um, and mostly due to that, because before he was one of the greatest uh, philosophers of our time. Um, yeah? So there's a connection too. Yeah? And uh, so, 
we have spoken a lot about him, but we, we can see that on so many levels. Yeah? And we can see it now. I mean, if as an actor you cannot make a satire on the measures without losing your livelihood, and that's taking place in Germany now, you know, I mean, this is scary. I find that absolutely terrifying. Tim? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Marco, for that. Um, so I have uh, two questions. I, I don't know the novel, and I, I certainly uh, will buy it, uh, unfortunately, probably from Amazon. So, um, but uh, I guess the first question is, so the, 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 in the book, there, it doesn't take place during a pandemic. There's no, there's no, there's no uh, issue of, uh, of anything sort of along the lines that, that we, we have faced, right? It's kind, it's kind of hinted at that there was the risk okay. and therefore, or there was one and then, you know. Okay, so um, well, then that leads to the, to the second question. Um, and I think this may be some of where the, dis, uh, the differences are arising. So um, it, it, the question f for me is, it, does one have the right to illness during a pandemic? And, and it's interesting that in your response, in your response, your responses to us, the, the your your response is couched in there may be we need to have a discussion, a true discussion about the epi, about the epidemic and the numbers. The idea being that the numbers, according to you, don't show us or may not show us, uh, you know, experiencing this epidemic or a pandemic, mm -hmm. and and that's where your argue, that's what your argument hinges on because if you have a right to illness, you can't have it, and I think you would agree, if there is a pandemic, the right to illness is dangerous, right? And so, hence, we need to have a discussion about whether we're in a pandemic or not. Just, that's sort of the, sort of the, it's a comment slash question. But the second is just, and, and I, I know you're not an anti-vaxxer, I know you're not, um, but what about sort of, you know, right to illness as something that one would choose um, and not getting, you know, vaccines for measles or whatever it is, classic example. I mean, so where does one, where does one draw the line? I mean, the, the, the one presumably wouldn't draw the line on, on that kind of vaccine, but that, but that was the result of a pandemic mm -hmm. or a series of epidemics, right? So, you know, I, at what point, am I, am I reading you correctly, I guess is the question, and then at what point do you see drawing this line of a right, of a right to illness? Um, I, and it's an important point. I mean, I might choose to, rather than say a right to illness, it might be, another way of translating it would be the right to, um, to experience or to be with other people um, in ways that aren't sanctioned by the state, right? And, and there clearly are, you know, positive parts to that, right? Art, creativity, things that just aren't sanctioned, that's a good thing. I, I would think, um, but at the same time, I return to the question. So where where is one where is one drawing the line? And and, and so, yeah, no, you very you coached your your point very well. Um, I think that um, this right to illness um, would not even be an issue if the basis on what all of this what is happening now is uh, uh, is constructed um, was there. I don't think that anyone would claim a right to uh, die on the street. You know, if uh, there was an evident um, sort of pandemia where people really just die in the streets, people would not use their right to illness. They would be very happy to avoid getting ill. Um, the thing is that it doesn't seem to be convincing for many people what's going on as a being such a risky uh, environment. So I think immediately when that becomes clear that it is a terrible risk and that everybody um, of us needs to take all these measures in order to save oneself and everybody else, it would not even be necessary to have a debate about that. But that is not the case. Uh, and so there should be a debate about that before we take such measures and uh, with such immense consequences on all sorts of levels. So that's actually really, we have to establish the basis, the, the databases, uh, what's really going on. And I don't think it is done properly. So that's uh, a very important thing. So where does it start? And I think probably uh, there was something else that you mentioned, and I should react to that, but it slipped my mind now. 
Doesn't matter. I, I know that, that everyone is hungry. Um, uh, no, I just, just. Well, I mean, I, well, I think you know the, the other thought here is something that uh, you know Judith Butler wrote about years ago about when you know not being able to see um, grief or mourning, right? Um, and I and, and you know I come from from an American context like like Michael, and and what's stunning to me is that. We, you know, we can we can read um, anonymous reports because nurses and doctors apparently have signed all of these non-disclosure agreements, so they can't really tell you what's going on. And there there are no media images of what's going on. Um, we just you you get you know the classic shot. So that would be the the flip side of what you're saying, which is there's the the numbers and and, and we can have a we can have a difference of opinion about that, but but. Certainly in, in, I don't know the European context well, uh, but in, in Italy, I mean, there are occasional reports, but you're not getting that kind of immediate um, picture, right, that communicates the effective reality of this. So that, that part works both ways. You know, it would be, what you're describing, it seems to me, and sort of having the discussion about the numbers, would need to be also includes something like these effective reports. Because I think if you had those, then the, re then the effective reality of, of, the, of, the, of what's going on might qualify as a pandemic or an epidemic. I don't think it's just about that, about the numbers. I don't know if, that, if that's... Yeah. We, that's we spoke fair. quickly about that before, and I know that you have been really affected yeah. very badly by that. And I'm really sorry, and I know that People are. I don't deny that things are happening, obviously, yeah? no, very clearly. Um, but uh, I think that's actually quite a good thing to, to see. Actually, what we are talking about here in, in places like Estonia, Germany, Cyprus, the places where I know my way a bit, um, that is only a media effect. There are very few people who could tell you stories like, yeah, I've seen it, I've experienced it in that way. Some people might know one or maybe two people who have died who were generally very old. Who, you know, um, Every 18 months you would know somebody who dies of some kind of virus, yeah, flu or whatever, when they are at a certain age at risk and, and so on. Yeah? So this is actually, if you don't have this entire construction around it, then I, I dare to say that in most places people wouldn't have noticed that something is going on. And again, if people died around us all the time, we knew everybody, all these victims, yeah? and that goes beyond having a flu, because uh, a flu is a terrible thing, and that, but that happens. Uh, and it, it's happening now, and some people also have long-term effects for quite some time. That has always happened. But now it's been put into the focus of our attention, and people think, well, this is now a really, really big thing. But if you compare numbers, if you compare all the statistics, which are not invented statistics, but the official state statistics, it's not unusual. It's not unusual in, in most countries. As I said, there are places where it might be different. But um, yeah, so we, indeed we have to establish a real basis, and that needs to be done by the specialists, and it's not allowed for. I'm not giving a speech, I'm just uh, uh, making a point that I think that this is a kind of a, it crystallizes a bigger problem. I mean, we really have reached the time when we are unable to agree that there are facts. Mm. We, uh, this is basically the whole COVID pandemic has just happened at the perfect moment. It's the perfect storm. We have already lost the public sphere a long time ago. We have no place where we can have a debate. I mean, I agree with Michael that I think US is a perfect example of plenty of debates. They just don't happen between people. People just shout um, uh, that respected positions. And so we also now have alternative facts. We have alternative data sets. And so I think that you know, the debate that you're ideally envisioning is impossible. Sorry, but, you know, we, uh, and I think that's part of the reason why so many people are frustrated. We actually cannot have this debate because we have evolved to a position in which this debate is unhavable, so to say. And uh, I think that's partly, you know, one of the reasons why uh, the, uh, there is this persistent feeling that uh, there is something somewhere that we're getting, not, you know, not getting to share, mm. because we have lost that space. 
and we have lost that confidence that we can have this debate. And I think that that more abstract level uh, really hasn't been discussed at all. Like the whole uh, loss of public sphere of confidence in a public sphere, confidence in co community, some kind of a commons. Sorry, that's my end no, of my speech. A very <laughs> crucial point, but. in different countries. I would like to repeat this here. And uh, there are also places where you really could speak uh, absolutely objectively of a of public that doesn't exist anymore in this question. But I think, well, I understand your point and somehow I, I agree with you, but I still also uh, uh, agree with uh, Marco that, uh, well, um, we have no example of of uh, somebody who would be able to sort of uh, shape a public space we would need in this, uh, in this moment in Europe. But uh, I would still think that it is worth thinking of it and, and, and holding up the possibility and that we should actually aim for it and strive for it. Yeah, thank you both very yeah. much. I think that is a key point and that's actually one of the biggest risks that we are having now because, I mean, we are losing this now. You know, but that's happening now to a very large degree. There were tendencies already before, but um, that is one of the key points that I wanted to make. We need to um, invest in that. And if the public, the still official public space, because that is this, we have the mainstream organs for that. Yeah? Um, if they refuse a real discussion, but if they also become some kind of you know, obscure camp, um, then we are in a real bad situation. And that should not happen, but it is happening at the moment. I mean, can I oh, just, what can I do? I have a, another question. And I mean, we're talking about the need for debate and the need for spaces for debate. So it's a twofold question. One, you know, these Q&A sessions, one of the reasons why conferences can be so frustrating in my view, is that very often, myself included, um, you know, the speaker, the audience learns a lot from the speaker, in the best case, and I certainly uh, learned a lot from your talk. But very often the speaker, and I don't mean you, I mean a general, it's a general point, and my question will follow this, the speaker is the only one in the room who doesn't change his or her position. And, and so, so we learn, but the speaker, and again, it's not you, so don't misunderstand me yet, uh, doesn't. So my question for you is twofold. One, so we've had a debate. Has your position shifted? Because obviously there were compelling arguments, and I don't know where I stand, and it doesn't matter. Literally, it doesn't matter where I stand at this point. There were compelling arguments as far as I'm concerned, especially, I think, Timothy's argument for a kind of you know, affective truth. That, in my view, if I were in your position, would have made me shift my position. Because it seems to me, and now I'm talking in my own name, that what you seem to be suggesting, and since this is a university, and this is a place, you know, there's a kind of, how should I put it, and you made that point, there is a moral obligation in the room. And it's not an elephant, it's right here, out there, and for everyone to see. It seems to me that we're in a situation where, to use an analogy, and we've been talking and, and, and analogically uh, for two days now, uh, nobody believed that the camps existed. The, can't be. the camps existed. Uh -huh. Oh, it's not possible. They will come back. What? They have burned people? We don't have evidence for it. So what you're suggesting is, let's have a debate first and save people later, once we have enough evidence. Is that what you're suggesting? That's my question. No, definitely not. I think we need to have the debate now and not wait. No, that's, shouldn't that's exactly we save the, the people position. first? Huh? Shouldn't we save the people first and have the debate later? Ah, okay, I see. That, that's a point that I've heard uh, a few times uh, also in the uh, public, uh, well, publications uh, often. Um, <laughs> There are some things, if it's really urgent, if there's really a situation of urgency, and as you know, in most situations that we've had, I doubt that we have in Germany now a situation of urgency. It's not 
that urgent. So I think there needs to be debate. And we've had months and months of, uh, of a situation where there was no urgency whatsoever. With really, I don't know, one or two people dying off or with COVID a day. In a country where almost 3,000 people die every day. Yeah? There was no debate. Yeah? Um, so why not? Yeah? Why don't we use that? Why have we not done something over the past 18 months in that direction so that we can have an informed discussion now. Now it was always suppressed. Um, so as I said, I talk mostly about Germany here. Yeah? So, and I acknowledge that situations are different or have been different for short periods of time in different spaces. And then, of course, you have to act sometimes, of course. But um, as I said, if you act in a way that is not reflected well enough and that um, suppresses things that don't need to be suppresses, then I think, yes, somebody should stand up and say, no, why? That doesn't make any sense because exactly that also undermines the authority of any public measure afterwards and at the same time. So it's not in the interest of anyone in that way. Yeah? So you have to make sense and, and I think it's not very convincing, mostly. As I said, it's different in different places and so on. It's not a general remark for the entire world. Um, yes, maybe we have to. We have to. We, we continue um, over lunch, and we will hopefully continue also later on. We have another panel, and we have another. Pause for Marco, please. Table. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Yeah.